Welcome to today's tutorial covering ionic models. Ionic models describe the ionic mechanisms and the initiation of action potentials. We will have a look at the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which was derived from a squid axon. However, due to the similarities, we can transfer all concepts here to cardiac myocytes and to the modeling of cardiac myocytes. So let's get into it. Let's look at a single cell of a squid axon. In general, a cell membrane separates the intra from the extracellular space. There exist channels that connect both regions, namely the sodium, potassium and the leak channel. In a basic setup, we have a high concentration of sodium in the extra and a high concentration of potassium in the intracellular space. The question now is how to describe this system mathematically. To do that, let's just look at a single channel and ignore the rest for now. Also, the single channel stays closed. We have charges on both sides of the cell membrane and they are divided by a non-conductive layer. So it makes sense to look at the analogy of a circuit. In a circuit, this setup can be very well represented using a capacitor with the capacitance Cm, which stands for the capacitance of the cell membrane. We will now open the channel and allow for current flow. Opening the channel will not instantaneously result in an equilibrium, but rather allows a certain amount of current to flow. Using our analogy to the electric circuit, this can be represented with a resistor. And the resistance is the resistance of this channel, in our case the sodium channel. We, however, will be using the conductance, which is just 1 over the resistance, and we will be using this due to the fact that in the experiments Horchkin and Huxley did, they actually measured the conductance and not the resistance. Now with this, we have a simple model representing the cell membrane and a single channel. Looking back at the current flow, we see that the sodium flows due to the high concentration in the extracellular and the low concentration in the intracellular space. So there is a diffusion pressure and this is only decreased once the opposing force of the electric field is built up. In a steady state, when both of the forces match and there is no current flow anymore, that's what we call the Nernst potential. And it is different for each type of ion in each type of ion channel. Now we have to represent this Nernst potential in our circuit, which is done by adding a voltage source with a voltage exactly at the Nernst potential. In the circuit, it is set in serial with the conductance. Also, we will introduce the transmembrane voltage, which is defined as the difference in potential between the intra and extracellular space. Now, as you remember, we have three different channels, the sodium, potassium, and leak channel. And we want to represent all our channels with their respective conductances. This leads to the following circuit. The one thing missing is that the conductances are not constant. So with the change in voltage and time, the conductances will change. This is represented by these arrows. It means that we have a variable resistance, so a variable conductance. You will notice that the leak channel has no such error. This is due to the fact that the leakage current is assumed to be a sum of all background currents and its conductivity is taken as constant. Using Ohm's law, we find that the current for a single channel is given by its conductance, multiply, with the potential deviation from the Nernst potential. Now we need to define a direction for the current flow to define the direction of positive and negative currents, which is depicted here by the blue arrows. Using this, we can formulate an equation describing the circuit, and this is done using conservation of charge. We arrive at the following equation describing our system. On the left-hand side, we see the capacitive part, and on the right-hand side, we see that this has to be equal to the sum of all currents. However, we are interested in the transmembrane voltage. So using Ohm's law, we can reformulate the currents, and instead of currents, we use their conductance multiplied with the deviation from the steady state, which is given by the Nernst potential of each channel respectively. The unknown in this formulation are the conductances G. We have learned that they vary with voltage and time, but how exactly do they vary? So the question raised is, how do we model our conductance changes? Up until now we had this picture of three channels. But in reality, the cell membrane has many, many channels, 
And we need to find a way to put this large amount of channels into the three representative channels. And this is done as follows. Taking a look at our sodium channel again, the formulation for this is chosen so that we have a maximum conductance GNA max, which is the conductance when all channels are open. And we multiply that by a probability that the channel is open. So if 50% of our channels are open, we have 50% of GNA max. For the sake of saving space, we will denote GNA max in the following way. Like this, we have found a way to represent all channels of a single type in the cell membrane into a single channel. However, we do not know what this probability, this open probability, exactly is. So firstly, I would like to introduce you to the gate concept. In the gate concept, we have two states. The gate is closed or the gate is open. We define Q as the probability that the gate is closed and P as the probability that the gate is open. We also define transition rates to show when the system goes from a closed to an open state or vice versa. These are alpha and beta. Since we're talking about probabilities here, both probabilities have to sum up to 100%. If we look at the probability change, for instance dpdt, which is the open probability, we see or we understand that closed gates that open, so q times alpha, will have a positive impact, and open gates that close, so p times beta, will have a negative impact on the opening probability. In the last step, we want to have the dependence from only one variable, and we choose p here, so in the upper equation we can rewrite q as 1 minus p, and we arrive at this formulation. These are the basic formulations describing a single gate. Based on experimental data, Hodgkin and Huxley modeled a sodium channel using three M gates and a single H gate. The H gate is called the inactivation gate, since the channel is open in an initial state and then gets inactivated by the H gate. While the M gates are activation gates, since they're closed in the beginning but then open. The N gates are also activation gates, and four N gates describe the potassium channel. We will have a look at their mathematical formulation in a moment. First, let's go back, and we now know the formulation for our open probability. So for sodium, it's m to the power of 3 times h, and for potassium, it's n to the power of 4. If you think about the formulation we derived earlier for our whole system, and we now plug in this model for the conductivities, we arrive at the following formulation for our system. But how is m, h, and n described mathematically? They are described via their change with time using the transition rates from the gating concept, which are dependent on Vm. However, we do not know what alpha and beta are since we don't know the opening and closing rates of these channels. The solution here comes once again from experimental data, namely voltage clamp experiments. In these experiments, opening and closing rates were determined and are given as follows for each channel. We now have the opening and closing rates independence of the transmembrane voltage, Vm. Using this, we can look back at all our formulations and solve the system of differential equations for Vm. The result, however, would be the following. Neither m, h, nor n, or Vm would move out of their steady state. We need to introduce an external stimulus to introduce a change to Vm, which then in turn will change the rest of the system. This is done by adding a stimulation current to the equation. You can see it here on the upper left hand side, I stim was added. Now using this, we have all our formulations and we can solve this system of differential equations for Vm. We can do this using Euler's method or Runge-Kutta, for example. If we solve this, we see again the steady state. Now at some time point, we introduce the stimulation current. 
this current has to be given with a certain strength over a certain time. And to have a successful stimulation, we need to have sufficient strength over a sufficient amount of time. If we have a high amount of strength, we can use a small time window to give the stimulus. And if we use less strength, we need to give the stimulation for a longer time. So we have to choose our stimulation values to be above this threshold curve, shown here. If we do this, we will have an adequate stimulus pushing the system into a different state and from there propagating some kind of change throughout the system through time. If the stimulus was given correctly, we will see a change in Vm and that introduces a change in the gates. We see that the M gates open rapidly and while the H gates slowly start to close, there are still enough sodium gates open for sodium to flow from the extra to the intracellular. We therefore see a further change in the transmembrane voltage. In the second stage, we see that the M gates stay open, however the H gates start closing. So the sodium inflow is reduced. At the same time, more N gates open, and the N gates represent the potassium channels. Since the potassium concentration in the intracellular is higher, with the opening of the N gates, potassium flows from the intra to the extracellular. So we have a current that is working against the sodium inflow. When both currents are the same, we get a plateau in the transmembrane voltage. And with more H gates closing, so sodium, we are left with an increasing contribution of the potassium gates allowing outflow of potassium, which over time puts our ionic model back into its initial state. Due to a slower closing time of the potassium gates, they remain open even as its initial stage is reached and we have hyperpolarization. So we arrive at a transmembrane voltage that is at a lower value here than the starting point. With the closing of the end gates, we slowly go back to the initial state of the system and the system is ready to receive a next stimulation. So, what have you learned today? You've learned the mathematical formulation of an excitable cell. You've also learned of the gating concept. So the gates, so there are gates, and they're voltage and time dependent, which makes the channels voltage and time dependent. This is done uh, as a statistical approach in order to combine the many channels in the cell membrane into single representative channels of each type. You know that the action potential is the sum of all currents flowing and because different currents are activated at different times the action potential changes over time. You know the mathematical formulation of a stimulation and you know that the action potential initiation depends on the stimulation and how the stimulation is given. That's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.